All right, hello and welcome to Accidental Origin Episode 8. My name is Brendan, uh, and this is your weekly writing web show, uh, where we talk about writing, art, creative process, and generally other fancy, fancy things. The fanciest, of course. For the, I don't know how many weeks in a row, uh, Ottawa is ridiculously hot only today. It was like 20 degrees the rest of the week. But today, today it's 30, more than 30. Um, and it's hot. It's very hot. I'm going to try and not say that it's hot as much as I can. As much as I can. Uh, but it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. So, yeah. Hope everyone's been having a good week. Things are good. My arms. My arms are funny colors. Why? Hmm, I'm not sure how I feel about this right lighting setup yet, but we'll discuss more of that in moments. All right. So yeah, we're back. We're continuing on with um, the short story, Fear the Siren. This week we're going to do uh, basically the rest of the planning stages for the plot. Uh, I've decided that next week we're gonna do characters. So that should be fun. I've been doing a little bit of research today on uh, Greek, well, mythological creatures in Greek mythology. So I have, I have an idea, I have an idea of who I want our mercenary to be. I have an idea, I have an idea. Um, so yeah, that's, that's awesome. But, uh, this is the introduction. So, uh. I'm going to update you with what's been going on with me this week, uh, specifically in terms of writing <laughs> and not just stuff in general. So yeah. So yeah. Hope the audio is all good. I played around with it a bit, but I couldn't. It's not quite where I want it to be yet. So I'm gonna keep working on that and hopefully I can get it somewhere nicer for next week. But yeah, it's not quite, not quite. Ugh. I don't know why I'm so quiet today. Very quiet today. So, uh, first things first, we are on to round two of Game Chef. It is now the review phase. So I've been given my games to review uh, and people have been given my game to review. So there's gonna be feedback sometime in the next couple of weeks, which is awesome. Which is awesome. Uh, 
Um, I'm super excited. I'm super excited to get feedback. I know I'm My, my game is playable. It's not fun. <laughs> but it is playable. Uh, but that's that's kind of the whole point, right? Well, you want your game to be fun. But the idea of a short competition is to challenge yourself in order to write. Uh, and design and, and do all those things and give you a framework. So... I think with the feedback, there's definitely something there that is worth working on. So I'm going to continue to do that once I get the feedback. Um, and, and all that stuff has been, like, all the stuff has been posted to the website, which you can see down here. Look at that. I got the point right first. First try. I'm getting better at this. Website is down there. Um, so you can, you can read that at your leisure. And if you do have any feedback, feel free to send it on. Contact info is also on the website. So yeah. I'm, I'm not a good person to play a drinking game on because I am very habitual in the way that I speak <laughs> and things that I do. So yeah. Be smart. Don't play any drinking games. <laughs> so tick mark number one, Game Chef update. Number two. <laughs> number two, uh, I spent a bunch of time today uh, trying to get my lighting correct because lighting a whiteboard I mean, mine's blue, but it's a dry erase board. And, and all that is very difficult. <laughs> well, I mean, lighting any reflective surface is extremely difficult. I made some headway. I got it to a much better point. But I still need... Um, it's still a bit too much. My frame is a little too small. So I can't even fit myself into the frame. You'll see the test frame behind me there, where where I was looking at. It's close. I need to get some small soft boxes for my little my little fill lights, so that I can do that properly. But progress is being made. Um, I was really hoping I would have it ready for this episode, because this episode would be a great one to draw on the walls. But that yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't where I wanted it to be. It's close. It's close. We've made some headway. All is a good thing. Learning process. Working on making things better. Tick mark number two. So, this comes to the last topic of the introduction. Something that I've been thinking about for the last little while. So, up to this point... I have been posting, well, with the exception of the game design ones, because I didn't have time to make them for those, uh, but up to, up to this point, pretty much every episode has had show notes. Uh, basically, my outline with filled in details of the material I'm covering for the week. I'm finding that they're taking up too much of my, my free time. So... I'm doing those when I should be writing or doing something else. And I'm actually a couple episodes behind right now because I was doing writing and some of that other stuff. So I wanted to get feedback from all of you about what I should do with the show notes. I do still want to have something. I think that's important. I think it's a nice component to the educational aspect of the show, I guess. Um, but we're going to have a little bit of a talk about that as well. But yeah, I, I was thinking that maybe I would just post the outlines that I write and not edit them. Or maybe the show notes are completely unnecessary. 
I, I, I like them, but if they're not necessary, then I'm not going to invest time in them so that no one will read them, right? Like, that's... There are, there are better things I can be doing. I can be writing more, and I can be doing creative things. I can be working on other stuff that will make the show better. So, yeah. Um, please, let me know. <laughs> Send me a tweet. Send me an email, whatever. Let me know what you think. Um, I'm interested to know. I'm interested to know if people are reading the show notes at all. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I like that kind of stuff. I do. I think it's valuable. It's just, you know, I only have so much time. And I need to, I need to pick things that will make the show better and not just things that I like, you know. So yeah, um, thought process, thought process, yeah, I mean that's fair Johnny, if you watch the show, then you, you get the gist, it was more of a kind of I included. I wanted to include them as a reference so that if you watch the VOD, or if, so if you watch the show or you watch the VOD, and then we're talking to somebody later or we're writing a project later, uh, later on, you could go back and reference them real quick. But, I mean, perhaps that's not the right approach. Perhaps there's a an easier way, to do something similar. Um, I'm not going to cut the episode descriptions with the like links and that kind of stuff. I, I, I love those and I think those are extremely valuable and whether or not people read the show notes, I feel like those links people will actually take a look at. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not planning on cutting that stuff, but yeah, but yeah. All the so yes and but yes and passionate keyboards. Here we go. <laughs> Whew. I had a thought, I just lost it. Damn. <laughs> oh well. my thoughts something important I forget ah. oh I remember now I remember now right so I had this thought earlier today and I originally conceived accidental origin as an educational show as a show to teach people about writing specifically Kind of in a similar format to what you get in, um, in like a post-secondary institution of sorts. Obviously, I'm not a professor <laughs> or anything like that, so I can't claim that I would have the same quality level as them. But that being said, um, have that kind of thing with with a proper outline, with with points, with things like that. But I realized uh, over the last week when I was thinking about it that I'm pushing really hard on the you need to learn things and you need to learn them in a certain order. And that's fine, but it's not super fun. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the most interesting thing to watch. And honestly, it's not, it's not even the most interesting thing to present all the time. Um, 
So I'm playing around a little bit more with the format, with what I want to do with the format. And I'd like to hear, I'd like to see some feedback. Um, I asked for a lot of feedback. I don't get a lot of feedback. I asked for a lot of feedback. But I'd like to see some more, I'd like to know what you think about opening up the show a little bit more. About making a little bit more freeform. By, you know, adapting to more situational stuff. Problems that people are having in chat. Problems that people send me. Um, things like that. Uh, so I'm thinking a lot about that and the first step of getting to that spot was making the less detailed outlines, not planning every single point. Uh, and I think that helps a little bit, but I'm not quite there yet where, you know, I literally started this off, started off this episode saying, yeah, we're going to be doing scene work today and we're going to be doing characters next week. Which isn't good, because I think at the point in the writing process we're at, those are the right spots to be in. But at the same time, like, does that mean next week I'm going to, like, say, what is a character? What makes a good character? What makes a bad character? And do things like that again? Or would it be better for me just to show my thought process and answer questions? Um give insight into things beyond just the theory. And, and this is a conversation I had with my friend Robin a while back, which I totally get. Um, theory is everywhere. It's easy to find writing theory. I like to think, and I, I could be wrong, I like to think that I present it in an engaging way. Uh, but, I mean, theory, at the end of the day, is theory. So, I mean, maybe there's... Is there more benefit to showing just the practical stuff? Is there less benefit to that? I mean, I don't... This first story, I really wanted to be kind of getting back to basics of a sorts. Showing the beginners the way. Uh, introducing writing to people who don't necessarily know anything about writing. Um, but maybe that's the wrong approach. Maybe I need to approach it from a, I know writing, here's how you should think about writing. And talk about, like, talk about the basics when someone asks a question, when someone wants that information. So, I mean, these, these is, this is not something that's a concrete decision. It's something that I'm open to trying. Um, I, I, want, I want the show to be engaging. I want people to be interested in watching. You know, to be hyped up for the next episode. Uh, I want the stories I write on the, on the show to be engaging. Um, and I think they will be. But it's a process, right? It's a learning process. I mean, I'm also the type of person who ask a lot of questions. I'm very good at asking questions. And the reason I do that is because it helps me think through my problems. It happened a lot on uh, the game design episodes where I would just ask questions and the answer would come to me. So In a way, I, I'm right now. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to 
think through the process. I'm trying to ask the right questions to get to where we want to be. Um, and, and I'll continue to do so until I'm, until I'm, well, until everyone's, until everyone's having tons and tons of fun. <laughs> um, So yeah, th these are the things that I'm thinking about during the week. And if anyone has any insight, feel free to let me know. Um, I would love I would love to hear what you think about that. Because um, hey, I mean, the the reason I wanted to start streaming, and the reason that I got back into Twitch Creative, is because I wanted to have conversations with creative people about creative things. I wanted to push my friends and I wanted my friends to push me so that we could all become better. And I think in some ways I'm doing that. Uh, there's been a few times where people in the chat have been like, oh, hey, that's a really cool way of thinking about that. And I'm like, yeah, do it. Move forward, do the things that you, that you love to do. Um, and I know Johnny hanging out there has been like, yeah, you challenged me so much. And I'm like, yes, job accomplished. And I'm not afraid of having the audience challenge me. I mean, I'm not going to be right 100% of the time, <laughs> probably not even 50% of the time, but that's okay. That's what learning is about, right? Um, Learning from your mistakes, learning from your failures. It's important. So, yeah. Please, let me know. <laughs> um, let me know more of what you'd like to see. Uh, do you want to see more game design stuff? Because I can do that. I can, I can hook you up. It's not a problem. I can do other stuff. Uh, I can do film stuff. I can do comic stuff. And I'm planning on doing those things. Because uh, I think this is a great... This is a great venue uh, with a lot of different creative types. Especially visual types. Visual artists and all that. Where I think doing things like comics, like writing, writing in visual styles, would come across very good. Um, would translate really, really well. I have this idea for this really cool special event I'd like to do sometime in the future uh, about having a, a script that we're working, a comic script that we're working on and having um, various viewers submit pages and putting it together as, as, as kind of a stream PDF collaboration of all of us. So yeah, um, I'm open. I'm gonna finish this short story either way. Um, in a couple of weeks, uh, and I think this is a good time to talk about this, in a couple of weeks, it's going to be my birthday. Uh, so for the, bir for the day before my birthday, which is a Sunday, um, two weeks from now, we're going to have a special uh, role-playing storytelling episode where I'm going to invite a bunch of people on and we're going we're gonna to do some storytelling stuff live, uh, which I'm super excited for. So that should be fun. Uh, but I'm also on vacation that week. So I'm going to try my best to get all of the rest of the prep work done on this short story so that that week... I can stream uh, a few more times during the week and we can do a, uh, like I can do a lot of the drafting that week, have a solid first draft done sort of thing. So that, yeah, like that's, that's my plan. I'd like to get all the prep work done uh, between this episode and the next episode so that after the fun episode, 
we can do draft it and get it done. And uh, yeah, that'll be a lot more of me thinking through problems and, and me working with the text and stuff like that. So um, yeah. <laughs> So, um, yeah, but yeah. With that in mind, now that we're half an hour in, and I've gone all existential and weird, let's, let's talk about what we're actually here to talk about. <laughs> talk about what we're actually here to talk about. So, today, uh, because I'm still experimenting with format and haven't changed it yet, we're going to talk about scenes. Um, scenes are the most basic unit of story. They are what make up pretty much every narrative. And... They are the next step from what we did last week with building our structure. Don't worry, Sam. There will be octopods. That, that is happening. Don't worry about it. <laughs> and I, like, I'm, I'm completely serious. Uh, I was doing a bunch of research before I started the stream on Greek mythological creatures, right? And there are a lot of weird Greek mythological creatures, let me tell you. Um, some notables being like spiders with snake arms and stuff like that. Because that's, that's not creepy in the slightest. Not in the slightest. <laughs> True story. Zeus was way into bestiality. That was a thing. That was a thing. There was... I was actually reading about it today. Where, um... Plato... Was it Plato? I think it was Plato. I don't know if I have it open right now. Uh, I believe it was Plato was trying to get uh, the Homer poems banned or at least uh, not referenced as much because of the God's dubious moral character <laughs> throughout the entirety of the Odyssey. Well, not the well to the Odyssey to a certain extent, but mostly the uh, the Iliad. So, you know, uh, their morality was really messed up. <laughs> that being said, the Greek approach to religion uh, was extremely different uh, than the way that we've kind of approached uh, Christianity, uh, which is. Beliefs aside, has been the the dominant religion of the last fifteen hundred years or so, worldwide. Um, so there's a lot of influence narratively taken from from Christianity, um, and the and the way that our our societies are constructed uh, in a lot of ways. <laughs> yeah, so. A lot of the ways that the Gr Greeks approach religion was that humans were humans, gods were gods, gods were all powerful, but gods could do whatever they wanted. And if the humans angered the gods, they would be punished. Divine retribution. So 
So you couldn't be boastful, couldn't be prideful, couldn't be arrogant. That gets you turned into stuff, which is not fun for anybody. Uh, Arachne, Queen of the Spiders. Half spider, half female, because she lost a weaving competition. Well, I mean, the stuff about predetermined ends really is a lot more Norse mythology than Greek mythology. But you are correct. There was a lot of oracles and divining and that kind of stuff in Greek mythology. Um, in fact, I mean, visiting the oracle was, was something people did uh, all the time to gain guidance. And uh, a lot of the stories are born at a lot of the myths that we know are born out of tasks that oracles have given heroes. Um, there's a lot of that. We should, we should totally do this, Sam. I debate, I debate very heavily that the Titans were gods. But that gets into a whole lack of weirdness that debate does. <laughs> um, so I wouldn't worry too much about that. I know what you're talking about, but it's not coming to me. It's not coming to me. I don't know enough about Athena um, other than her origin story and the thing about... Nope, I'm thinking of Artemis. I'm not even thinking of Athena. Yeah, I got nothing. <laughs> For the record, I'm super into Atlantis. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm super into Atlantis. <laughs> uh, especially Da Vinci's interpretation of Atlantis, but also the stuff that appears in Homer. But that's a conversation for another time. Another time. Just checking my notes here real quick. All, all four of them. Okay. So we're here talking about scenes. We're here to talk about scenes and writing. So, what is a scene? A scene is basic is the most basic building block of a narrative structure. My lighting is really messed up right now. I see all blocky. I'm all blocky. Ugh. 
I have a couple of conflicting thoughts, and one of them is to remain distracted and keep talking about mythology. Um, and the other is to just push forward and attempt to, to talk about scenes, which I have so far failed to do. But yeah, uh, I think it's important to talk about mythology because like Christianity and the Bible and all that, uh, mythology has, uh, especially, especially Greek and Roman mythology, but they're not the only ones. Um, I mean, keeping in mind, this is all coming from a Western European perspective. Uh, and yes, North America is Western European perspective. Um, so... These are the basis for, for which most of our stories are told and have a lot of connections. Uh, oh, this, okay. This is the perfect time. I've been wanting to talk about this for like months and, and there was never an opportune moment. So here, 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 here we go. Here we go. There's a concept uh, that I studied in university called intertextuality. And intertextuality is how books, because uh, I studied this in English, so it was books specifically, but this is also true of art, it's also true of film, comics, uh, video games. It's true of all of them. But intertextuality is the, is the specific study of how books influence each other. It's identifying the dialogue and the references that are that are something from something else that came before. And also things like parody, satire, um, genre conventions. How many fantasy films do we see nowadays that are based on things that were codified in Lord of the Rings? How many sci-fi films have we seen that were codified by things like Flash Gordon? How many things reference Shakespeare? The Bible. Greek myth. These are all forms of intertextuality. Intertextuality is super fascinating to me. Uh, a lot of the guys, or sorry, guys, a lot of the people that I really respect as writers, uh, as, as storytellers, are people who know how to take all of that stuff that came before and write something interesting based on that. People like Guillermo del Toro, who can deconstruct genres. Um, people like Scott McCloud, who literally, his, his claim to fame is deconstructing an entire medium in understanding comics. Who used Zot, his superhero comic, to tell a story about people, about art, about life. And, and in effect, deconstructed a lot of what superhero comics were doing at the time in a way completely different from the way that Watchmen de deconstructed uh, superhero comics. I, 
I mean, Drawny, my lovable ma, Drawny, uh, she mentioned Percy Jackson. Percy Jackson is quite literally a bunch of references to old stories, old parallels. Mythology is super interesting. Because when you look at mythology across the world, you begin to see reoccurring patterns. You see similar types of stories, similar symbols, similar, well, similar characters. All of these things just go and show us that we're one people. That humanity interprets the world in a very similar way. And I'm a big fan of Joseph Campbell and the monomyth idea. I mean, it's not perfect. I think there are, there are definitely cultural differences but there's as many similarities as there are differences. You can see a commonality. Um, and today, when we're surrounded by the internet, when we're, when we're connected to everybody all of the time, We have so many more influences than we ever did before. And, and it's, it's wonderful and fascinating. And we're also seeing, um, we're also seeing a lot more references that trends that jump between mediums. We're making video game references in films. We're making novels about video games, about films. Comic books, the type of storytelling that you see in comic books, video games that deal in panels, movies that deal in panels. We are in the, the most tumultuous age of amalgamation and transformation that we've ever been in and it, and it's awesome but at the same time it's it's super easy to fall in the trap of oh this is like something else or to base something too heavily on something that came before so my point I guess in all of this is that intertextuality is important. It's important to study the things that came before you, the things that influenced what you, what has influenced you. It's important to study things that have shaped our culture because understanding where things came from can give you insight into the mindset of a, the writers who came before you, but B, your characters. You begin to understand your own psychology and your character psychology and how they deal with certain societies. And you can start to see, uh, and this is something we're going to talk about a little bit more towards the end with, with the writing sci fantasy and science fiction for the book club, but you see how those influences have built stories. Right, Johnny? Like, it's, it's part of art. It's part of everything. And context is super important. Context is one of the big things that drive intertext intertextuality. And it's not something that's talked about enough, in my opinion.
Because... I think, I think the thing that really fails context or really fails because of context are actually reviews. We're in a society where everything is rated. It's easy to go and look, a, look up online someone's opinion about something. But what a lot of those people don't do is they don't give context for their opinion. And that matters. I'm going to bring up H.P. Lovecraft. Brilliant writer, extremely creative. Um, extremely creative, uh, designed a world that has, that has blown our minds for over a hundred years uh, that people can't, can't stop referencing. Super racist, super racist, but contextually, Almost everyone at the time was racist. And I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm just saying it, it's easy for us to judge from our society, the way that our society developed. But at the time, there are, things, there, there are other things that were happening. And you've got to take that into context. Knowing certain political histories so you can see where satire came from. Why did this author write uh, a satire of this popular book at the time because of politics, because of society, societal changes, because of protests. There are things that matter to why stories are told and how stories are told. Context matters. And I make the argument, I make the argument that the process for technology and the process for writing and art are the same. They are not different. Science is extremely creative. People don't think about it in a creative manner necessarily, but it is a creative process. It's an exploration. And I think, I'm of the opinion uh, especially with, with a lot of the stuff that I've tried to adopt from, from art practices and things like that. But I'm of the opinion that Ortis should spend more time learning about technology and learning about how technology is created and, and forms and morphs um, and, and, and take things from inventors, from businessmen, from salesmen, Figure out why and how they're doing what they're doing and how you can better your art by adapting your process. And a, a, a part of that, um, excuse me, oh. So Sam's right. I mean, what happens is, is you, once artists get skilled, then they challenge each other and they produce more technically complex things. But then you get the next part, the next swing of the pendulum, the next cycle, which is a deconstruction of those things that came before. Where they break all that technical stuff and, and, and try and get at its essence. For painting, that was Pablo Picasso. For music, that was 8 minutes 50 seconds. I think that's what it's called. 8 minutes 50 seconds. It's a score that is literally the music of the audience. There was a score during the deconstructionist period of music that was written for typewriters. So you had to have like a hundred different types of typewriters and they all played like hit specific keys at specific times and made music. So 
So, yeah, deconstruction, it's an important part. Um, I will write it down for you, Johnny. It's not something that's easily Google. It's not something that you can easily Google, uh, unfortunately. And I don't know if that's because there's a, a better term for it that I don't know about, but this is how we talked about it when I was in school. Uh, in, in a few different classes, not like, if it was one class, I'd be like, oh yeah, the professor just made that up, but it was in several classes. Um, but yeah. It's a crazy thing. But this, like, naming things is how society kind of evolves. You can't know what something is until you give it a name. You can know that it exists, but you can't describe what it is without giving it a name. I'll give you an example of that. Describe to me what the color blue is. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for chat to catch up with the delay. Also, Johnny, I'm going to try once I get my lighting correct, I'm going to use the whiteboard a lot more. Because I do agree with you, I need to do some more stuff. So I'm starting to get... So I'm starting to get definitions of blue. And I'm going to read them out. So, blue is my favorite color. The color blue is the brainwave pattern created by the impact of certain frequencies of light on the retina. A color that means cold, sad, depressing, also water and sky. So then, so here's the thing. And, and here's kind of the point of this exercise. What if what if there was no term for brainwave pattern or for retina or frequency of light or cold or sad or depressing or water or sky? Favorite or color? We have given language well and, and, and here's the kicker, because I'm going to describe, I'm going to describe language and I can only use labels. Language is a oral, a set of oral symbols, stuff that we've interpreted over time to mean certain things that change as society changes. And I agree with you, Sam. They exist. They have always existed. But you can't have a conversation about them until both of the, con the conversers have a similar term to use in order to describe something. It's, it's one of the things that makes translations so hard. 
where there are inflections that we have no words in English for. Where there are concepts that we don't understand because we don't have a label for them. And so they get translated to the closest thing and some, some context is lost. And I agree with you that that's what math is for. That's what um, music is for. That's what art is for. Visual art. But at the same time, what we're doing here is we're writing. We're using this set of language in order to describe something, particularly a narrative. And well, I don't know. I've said a lot of things, um, but it's five to eight, and I need to take a break uh, and cool off a little bit. But yeah, think think about think about what I've said. <laughs> um, Yeah. When we get back, we're going to talk about scenes. Um, and instead of talking, well, actually, instead of talking about scenes, I think I'm just going to dive right into doing scenes for the short story. I think it'll be a better... Um, Yeah, I think I think it'll just be better <laughs> than than trying to whittle away at the definition of scenes uh, and what scenes mean. I think this the stuff I want to talk about will come out as I as I work on it. <laughs> and I definitely think that that's something I'm going to try and do more of as the episodes progress because. As fascinated as I am about the stuff we just talked about, what did you really get out of it? How is it going to influence your writing? I think I need to open up a word processor and, and write and, and talk about writing as I write and talk about why I'm thinking what I'm thinking. Yeah. I think that's what I'm going to do. But first, we're taking a break. So yeah, break time. 